Oh yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, um, like I mentioned, this presentation is going to be an overview of the internship over the last uh, four or five months. And I uh, just wanted to say I've had a great time. I've learned a lot, met all of you guys, which was really awesome. And uh, really wanted to thank everyone for uh, making me feel super welcome and uh, helping me out throughout the process and helping me have a great time here. Um, so in terms of the actual internship project, uh, for the first month, I kind of worked on different, pro uh, different mini projects that got me introduced to a variety of different ideas. And one idea that I really uh, was interested in was dendritic networks and its applications. Um, I was really interested because it incorporated some of the core ideas um, of the thousand brains theory, like sparsity, but um, kind of took it to um, another level in terms of incorporating another aspect of neuroscience, which was the dendritic uh, aspect of it, which I really thought was interesting and I thought could have a lot of applications in a variety of spaces. Um, and I, my research um, before Numenta was more focused on reinforcement learning and I had, I'm really interested in that topic. So um, I was really curious as to how these two ideas could be combined in a project. Uh, some of my initial ideas were vaguely around um, having an agent learn specific, like higher level skills um, in an unsupervised way using dendrites. Um, this sounds vague and it like after reflecting on it for a bit, it was kind of vague. Um, like I think I wasn't really clear on what exactly some of the aspects of this were and there were a lot of open questions on the RL side. So um, I tried to simplify the problem a little bit and I thought continual reinforcement learning with dendrites would be a very interesting direction, um, particularly because uh, Karan and Subitai and um, now Jeremy are working on that in like a supervised setting. So maybe um, applying that to a reinforcement learning setting would be interesting. Again, however, uh, continual reinforcement learning is relatively un underdeveloped. So like kind of finding a good environment and finding a good problem formulation uh, was kind of difficult based on the literature. And uh, I think finally I landed on multitask reinforcement learning with dendrites, which um, luckily is related to these last two topics in that um, it basically involves an agent trying to learn multiple different tasks, except it's a, a bit easier of a problem to tackle than the last two and more fleshed out because um, the agent gets access to the tasks and it's much more clear mathematically what the problem statement of multitask reinforcement learning was. So this kind of allowed us to test uh, dendrites in isolation without worrying too much about um, coming up with a better like reinforcement learning problem. Um, so this last one is like kind of what I landed on. So an overview of the problem statement of multitask RL. Um, so in normal reinforcement learning, you have an agent, the agent interacts with the world, um, the world, and in this case with a single task, such as like playing chess or um, opening a window, for example, is represented by something called a Markov decision process, which um, basically encodes the rewards the agent receives and also, also the transition dynamics of the world. So how the world changes. And the goal of the agent is to learn something called a policy um, to solve the task. And the policy is something that just takes in what the agent observes and outputs the action that the agent takes um, at every given time. In multitask reinforcement learning, the setup is quite similar. But now we have many different tasks, and each task has its own MDP. Um, there's like a fixed set of tasks or a task, task distribution. So and um, during the learning process, the agent kind of gets to see all of the tasks um, it, it will encounter. So this is different from like continual um, learning settings where the tasks are kind of streamed in sequentially and you don't come back to certain tasks. Um, and there's usually a shared structure between the different tasks. So this allows, if, if there wasn't a shared structure, then the agent would just have to kind of memorize each one or learn each one separately. But because now there's a shared structure, this allows the agent to take advantage of this to perhaps um, like use one task to aid in the learning of another task. 
And the goal here is to learn a single policy to solve all the tasks. So it's slightly more challenging than normal reinforcement learning. Yeah, and uh, the policy knows what task to solve. So it's given an ID of the task. And um, it's a step towards continual reinforcement learning, but it, it avoids a lot of the kind of um, underlying challenges, specifically something called non-stationarity. Um, some of the challenges in multitask RL are, I can go through these kind of quickly, uh, gradient interference where um, the updates for one task could interfere with the updates for a different task, uh, specifically because they have different loss function or they induce different loss functions. And another big one is representational capacity, where now you're having one network trying to solve all the tasks um, and each task typically has a different type of behavior. So you have to find a way to encode all of this in one network without um, there being too much interference between different aspects of the network. So again, it's a, it's a step towards continual learning, which I guess is like the ultimate goal, but it's an easier problem to solve for sure. And this diagram shows the um, interference. Like you have one loss for task one and another loss for task two. If you combine them by adding them, you get this combined loss. But if you apply like a gradient descent algorithm to this um, naively, then you get all these different gradient directions. This red direction is the gradient step you take and it kind of points off in a nonsensical manner because when you combine the two tasks, they interfere with each other. Um, so the, the environment in which I decided to uh, test the, the uh, project out was something called Meta World. And this is a robotic manipulation environment where there's 50 different um, tasks that a robot arm has to do. And all these 50 tasks are shown here. So for example, like uh, turn on a faucet or push, some, to push an object to a location. And what the agent observes is not the, like, it's not like an image. So it's a, it's a vector that summarizes where the object is, what, where the um, robot arm is and where the robot arm has to move the object to. Um, so this makes it like a lower dimensional um, input, which makes the learning a little easier. And then the actions that the agent outputs are um, the joint torques. So each there's, I think, uh, four joints here. So it's a four degree of freedom. So the torque for each of those joints. And the meta world environment contains two um, multitask benchmarks, one with 10 tasks and one with 50 tasks. So how, um, so I guess the specific project in terms of dendrites was how can we use dendritic networks to achieve strong performance in multitask RL? And the hypothesis was that um, the properties of dendritic networks, specifically the modu um, modulating and contextual gating can be used to mitigate some of the challenges that I mentioned earlier, specifically gradient interference and um, also representational capacity. And several closely related questions to this was what is the role of uh, weight and act activation sparsity in all of this and what's important for practical dendritic performance. And what I mean by this is that um, I guess like in reinforcement learning settings, there's a lot of forward passes and backward passes that need to be done. So um, like the performance of the dendrites need to be um, somewhat practical in order to get good training time. So that kind of brings me to the first challenge that one of the first big challenges in the project was the efficiency of dendrites. Um, so A, they have a lot more parameters than like standard MLP networks. So for each hidden layer, you have N segments, uh, which takes in an input of uh, C dimensions and outputs in a, a vector of H dimension. So it adds this many parameters per hidden layer, which can kind of blow up pretty quickly. And um, once we realized that the dendrites were pretty slow compared to MLP networks, we did a lot of profiling and realized that there are also uh, several expensive operations, specifically an absolute value and max operation, which chooses the winning segment. 
And because reinforcement learning has a lot of forward passes to collect data and um, also a lot of backward passes to learn because um, it, the, 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 it needs a lot of gradient updates, um, the efficiency of the network can be a bottleneck. So profiling the dendrites revealed some of these slowdowns and several possible optimizations. So um, a kind of temporary solution, which doesn't solve the whole issue um, that we landed on was using an optimized one segment dendritic MLP. So this does kind of um, reduce the capabilities of the dendrites because it's one segment, um, but it does, um, the trade-off is that it's a lot more computationally efficient because it, it, it can avoid this absolute value and max operation and also scale down the number of parameters. In terms of the code base, uh, so yeah, we created a uh, new NuPic embodied code base and uh, we integrated the dendrites with two existing reinforcement learning code bases. Uh, the first is called garage and the second is called soft modularization. Garage is a more established RL library uh, with strong meta world support. And what I mean by established is that um, it has like a big, bigger community behind it. And there's like regular updates and things like that. Um, whereas soft modularization is just a research repo made by a couple of people. Um, but the good thing there is that there's a good baseline to compare to. And uh, yeah, uh, the baseline is, was like the state of the art in the previous version of the environment. The final code base we have now is has been integrated with Garage and Meta World V2, which is a newer version of Meta World, um, both of which are more stable. Uh, we also some of the we we also encountered some challenges with, with Garage, so we made some modifications to that that were made to like suit our needs and to speed up experiments, uh, which were taking like many days um, in the fifty test scenario, and we recently have been get, able to like reduce that to at most like one or two days to get reasonable results. And in most cases, like a few hours. So um, I think, yeah, so the, the final code base has been integrated with Garage and has been modified to A, kind of integrate well with Nupic Research and Nupic Torch and also um, get experimental time down a lot, so. Hey, Kosh, I have a question. Yeah. Um, uh, just to give me some like a, a, a baseline. If, if if someone was running these experiments without the dendritic uh, mm -hmm. extension, I mean, would these run in hours? They run in like one day, uh, run in minutes. I just kind of how 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 slowing down did the dendrites make these experiments go? Did yeah, good question. Um, so even with the optimized like one uh, one segment uh, dendrite, so the, those would take around a, a little less than like twice as long as the MLP networks. Um, so for like, yeah, so if the MLP network would take one day, then an, like a similar dendritic mm -hmm. network with dendritic segments would take like two days. And, and, and just one one segment, uh, one dendritic. So it's kind of like almost like linear with the number of segments then. Yeah. I mean, if you consider like a, the base neuron is like one segment, then you can say that. And then you add a, yeah, and the dendrite segments twice as, twice as long, roughly. So. I think roughly, yeah. Okay, thanks. Yeah. So some of the initial results. Um, so this is with the soft modularization code base and an older version of the environment. And this is with 10 tasks and um, the dendritic networks were showing uh, quite a bit of like quite good performance. So the left side is the dendritic networks and we were getting around 80% success rate which means that on average, eight out of the 10 tasks were being solved after um, around 15 million training steps. So that the training steps indicates that 15 million transitions from the environment are collected. Um, whereas the MLP networks um, were getting around 40%, um, 35 to 40% success rate. So this was really promising and um, kind of validated some of the ideas of the project and some of the potential for dendrites to be applied in this space. I have another question here, Kosh. Mm -hmm. um, what level of, of active, was there any activation sparsity in this experiment or is this uh, or not? 
So this didn't have activation sparsity, um, but they had weight sparsity, 50% weight oh. sparsity. So I was trying to understand, you know, I mean, this sounds maybe a little weird, but you know, why isn't it hundred percent? And um, uh, because the, the general idea of dendrites should, should really separate spaces, but, it, but if only if the activation sparsity, activation sparse too. So now I, am, I think I can understand why yeah. you only got 8%. If you had activation sparsity, you might get hundred percent test. So. Uh, yeah, so I, I tried some activation sparsity, uh, but didn't aggressively tune it, and the results were worse. But I think, um, yeah, but I would say that's probably not related to the dendrite part. It's probably related to the fact that it's tricky to get, you know, these networks running with activation sparsity. Yeah, I agree. Um, okay. Yeah, I think with uh, I think with activation sparsity, like from the experiments I ran, I think it's. Uh, I mean, harder it, yeah. to tune, but I think they, yeah. they have a good, better. I mean, final humans promise. humans can do many, many tasks very reliably, right? We don't get mm -hmm. confused. Um, and so ultimately, I think, you know, a, a network with activation sparsity and a sufficient number of dendrites uh, should also have achieved very, very high performance. Uh, and, uh, but I, I think I got it. So, it's, but anyway, so far, so good. That's good. Yeah. And I have some results uh, on the newer environments with activation sparsity in a couple, couple slides. So, um, also, the dendrites um, should be causing some amount of sparsity as well. I don't know if you looked at that explicitly, although with one segment, it's kind of, it's not going to be that great. They actually would cause, uh, they, would, they would actually cause activation sparsity? Yeah, because they can turn off neurons themselves. Uh, uh, but there's no enforced sparsity. So they, there's oh, no actually, enforced they, sparsity. But, so, uh, okay, that's interesting. Not, not like a typical biological network where... Uh, dendrites don't right. turn off neurons, but yeah. in this case, they actually can turn off neurons. They could, yeah. So then it gets hard for me to understand. Then, okay. Yeah, I think it'd be like a softer version of sparsity, where like you would have certain neurons that could be turned get like close to zero, but not exactly zero. No, no. Um, whereas some could be like yeah. kept multiplied by close something closer to one. Anyway, again, these are very nice results, uh, although you know properly done, not, not that you didn't do it properly, but in a, in a full implementation of the theories and we should, have, we should really have almost 100% success on many tasks. Yeah. So, but this is giving a, this is sort of an approximation of what the follow-up network would be, that's pretty good. Yeah. Um, so some of the challenges with the V1 meta world, which is the initial environment design from the developers was that the reward design was really unstable, uh, meaning there were, the rewards could get an, on the scale of like many thousands, uh, which kind of causes experiments to crash like this, where you have increasing performance and suddenly it just drops um, because the, the network is dealing with huge losses and huge just high magnitude numbers. And um, this can cause like bad grading steps. And with this code base, it also, when we transitioned to the 50 task environment, it also took around one week to get this result, um, which was, which is really bad because in order to see this artifact emerge, it took a week. Um, so, can you explain uh, uh, again what was the cause of that crash? I didn't catch it. What you know? What do we have? A, like a very high level explanation of that? Yeah. So I think it, the hypothesis is that um, the reward from the environment basically was designed so that. The, the numbers, the scalar numbers returned were really high. And this, because the, the rewards are used a lot in the loss functions um, for the actual neural networks, then like the losses are also super high. Um, so again, I'm not super familiar with these things. So when you say the, there's some sort of, um, there's a reward function, which says, hey, you, you know, this is good. But for some reason, you're saying that number gets very high at some point. Um, yeah. And, and the reason it gets very high is why? Is it, is it like, uh, is it sort of going to some sort of uh, unstable oscillatory you know, re regime or thrashing or something like that? I don't understand why that. I, I don't have an intuitive sense or uh, reinforcement learning network to say why that loss function would get so high. Right. Um, well, I think the reward can get high because, well, the reward should get high as you do well on the task. But like a big part of designing an environment is deciding what kind of reward to give. And it can be bad if like the scale of the reward is super, super high. Uh, so I guess like a really simple example would be like, um, if you're playing a chess game 
and the reward is one if you win the game and zero if you minus one if you lose and zero if you draw you could also have a reward that's like a million if you win minus a million if you lose but why would that reward function again my ignorance excuse me for my reinforcement learning but why would that reward function change as you learn I mean, isn't winning a game one always one? Why would it all of a sudden start going up to like a million? <laughs> so what would cause it? I, I, I have a fundamental lack of understanding of how reinforcement learning works where that reward function would change. I don't understand that. The reward function doesn't change. Oh. But um, like the, as you learn the, like in this, in this environment, as you get closer to success, you get higher and higher rewards. Well, so initially. Uh, again, how do I get higher and higher rewards if the reward function doesn't change? I'm sorry. Well, that. because it, 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 the, I mean, the to me, the reward get... function sounds like the reward, dude. There must be two different things. <laughs> so in, the... in, in this case, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Pash, but it's mm -hmm. not that we have sparse rewards. Uh, like if you win, you get one. If you lose, you get zero. But we have rewards across the environment, uh, across the test. So if you get closer to the goal, you get a reward. Yeah. So this is like an, an aid to the agent. You can think of mm -hmm. like. Yeah. Yeah. But why would that? why would that reward change? I mean, it's like, hey, if you're getting close, it's still one to win the game. Uh, well, it's kind of like, um, so say you're trying to move an object closer to a goal location. So if you're really far mm -hmm. away, you get a reward of zero. If you get a little closer, it's one. If you get even closer, it's two. If you get really close, it's like 10. And if you get there, it's like 100. And that's that's a, just a basic function of how reinforcement learning works? Or that that's how the, uh, that's how the environment is designed. So when you're, Mm -hmm. designing the environment you have to decide okay how is the agent rewarded so that it can it knows what's good and what's bad that's, and that's, a, that's a kind of weird thing it's like it seems a little odd to me it, it sort of says you know like as you get closer and closer to being good at this you just get hyper you know excited or something you know, it's like, it doesn't seem natural um, um the, the dense rewards is sort of a hack at least i mean the the Traditional way would be to use sparse rewards, right? So if you win, you get a point. If you lose, you don't get a point. But this, the state space is huge, so the agent can never find a solution. So what people do in this sort of environments, like meta words, they create these dense rewards. So you mm -hmm. give like this intermediate breadcrumbs to guide the agent towards the goal. Yeah, but you could but, say you could say, okay, your reward for getting you know solving this problem is ten. And then you could have anywhere between zero and 10 along your way, right? Uh, you think the upper limit would be fixed as opposed to, oh, you get a hundred or a million or something like that. Um, or maybe it is fixed, it's just a big range. Is that what you're saying? I don't know. Yeah, I think that was a flaw with this initial. Yeah, I mean, this is, this is a surprising thing to me. It's like, oh gosh, you see something like this. And it's like, oh, damn, what happened, you know? So I'm trying to understand if this is a fundamental issue uh, with dendritic theory uh, or if it's really it's something else. And um, I'm hoping it's something else. And when I'm hearing, maybe that's, it is maybe something else. <laughs> yeah, I think it's, it, it's something else that is um, like exacerbated by this like bad reward design, which was fixed in this like V2 version, like yeah. version two of this. And also oh, this was, kind okay. of- Oh, it was fixed. Oh, I see. I, yeah. I didn't so, let you get there yet, sorry. No worries. <laughs> um, and this also happens with like this kind of crash after a lot of training steps is fairly common in reinforcement learning, regardless of what kind of network you use, just because like there's um, the, the way that algorithms work, there's like the training data kind of changes over time. And hmm. when that happens, it can happen. This well, that's a, it seems like a fundamental problem then uh, with reinforcement learning. Uh, it yeah, it's one of the problems. Yeah. You certainly don't want to see this. Yeah. Um, so this, so these kind of challenges um, motivated us to switch to a version two meta world, which had been recently released, and also switch back to the garage environment, which had a lot of more, lot more support and seemed like it would just be a good idea to integrate our code base with garage because a, it's much it's better built, uh, and we could like build on top of that for our needs and be in if we ever want to do different projects in the reinforcement learning space, um, it would be easy to do those on top of Garage. Um, so these are results with the V2 meta world environment and uh, the Garage code base. Uh, V2, the difference is the rewards are uh, on a better scale, like Jeff suggested, and also like some, some smaller changes 
And these changes as a whole are meant to make the training process more stable um, across like across different experiments. So it's uh, it's supposed to be a better environment, cap still capturing the multitask nature of it. Um, this is on the 10 task environment. So I trained a MLP network uh, with hyperparameters given by the developers. And surprisingly, it got 80% success rate on 10 tasks. And just to kind of validate that the dendrites could also do pretty well and really tune this at all um, and didn't have activation sparsity, this was just kind of a sanity check. Uh, the dendrites got 70% uh, success rate. And the kind of challenge here was that the baseline was already getting 80%. So uh, the room for improvement is much less compared to what we had before. And because like the success rate is a kind of noisy measure of how good the network, uh, how good the agent is doing, um, it was hard to, it, it would be hard to find, like clearly determine if a certain method was better than the baseline. So this kind of motivated us to uh, quickly move over to the 50 task scenario where there's likely to be much more uh, By the way, before you do that, it, it's not clear looking at these two charts that actually the the, un, the tuned baseline was actually better than the untuned dendrites. I mean, if you look at the scales and these charts, um, I'm not sure if it did, did you numerically verify that? Um, because if I'm looking at the chart on the left, you know, you'd say, what's the average performance there? I'd say it's around 70% or 75. I'm just curious, was it, was it actually substantially less? No, I don't think it was substantially less, uh, which okay. is why like I didn't bother tuning this much and move more yeah. to the 50 test okay. right. scenario. This, this, the right experiment was just to validate that like nothing major was going wrong. But it performed worse than previously where you had about 80%. So. Yeah, and uh, that could be due to a couple of things, perhaps like not tuning it mm -hmm. uh, at all. And also like switching environments uh, it can cause like it's a different environment now, so. I'm sorry, and what does KW mean? Uh, K-winners. Oh, okay, K-winners. Yeah. yeah. Um, so now uh, with 50, 50 tasks, these are kind of, um, these are the baseline results. So the right, the, sorry, the left side is um, what I call a narrow MLP, where the width of each hidden layer is 512 dimensions. And this is the standard network that, um, was is being used by the developers and was used in like the release paper for this environment, and the on average got around forty five uh, percent success rate after um, sixty million environment steps, which means like sixty million data points were collected throughout training. Um, one thing I noticed, one thing I was curious about was like, what if we just scale up the baselines? Is if we just naively increase the capacity of the networks? does performance increase by a lot? And it turns out the answer was uh, yes. Um, so just by increasing the width of the hidden layers um, of the MLP, we were able to get uh, like 70 to 75% success rate on 50 tasks. And this is with like no dendrites. So um, this, this was just an interesting uh, observation that I made kind of after this next experiment that I ran, which um, again, I kind of did the same thing where I had um, took a narrow, narrow meaning 512 dimensional hidden hidden layers, uh, dendrites. This one, I didn't have K winners um, just because uh, this was like the, the first experiment I ran with kind of the most basic addition to the MLP. And um, did no tuning on this one, whereas this one is more tuned. Um, so this uh, matched the performance of the MLP. Um, so this was more of like, again, a validation on the 50, 50 tasks. And then on the right side, um, I included, I, I, this is after, like this is the best result after several runs. So this is a much wider network with 2048 units per hidden layer and a K winners of around 0 0.2. And um, so 20% of the units are on at every hidden layer. And here the, the um, success rate 
was around 80% and um, occasionally got up to like 85, closer to 90%. Is that, I can't remember, is that about equivalent to what the non-dendritic network did with the so wide? The, sorry, uh, this, is, this is around like 10%. Or so the, like so 10%. the wide one on the right here got around to about a little bit less than 70. So yeah, we're, 70 doing, look, we're, doing, we're doing a bit better, but not super much better. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah. And um, I think for, for all of these, uh, are these fifty percent weight sparsities? And there's no weight sparsity in, uh, in these. So I, what the, the the hyperparameters I tuned here are like learning rate, the width <laughs> of the hidden layers, um, K winner mm -hmm. level, and uh, did not tune weight sparsity. Interesting. Okay. That's that's a good observation because that could make a big difference. Mm -hmm. and, and what what was the K winner level here? Uh, it was like a little less than 0 0.2. It was like a 0 0.19 or something. If you give this 20 percent on roughly, yeah. mm -hmm. if you give this presentation again, Akash, it would be useful to plot these on the same graph, um, these different colors or something like that. Because I'm constantly looking at these, trying to figure out, you know, because they're, they're basically plotting the same stuff. But you know, <laughs> your your charts are different sizes, and you know, they're trying to like. Yeah, it's a little hard to compare. <laughs> yeah. So, oh, right. Yeah. It would Sorry, be one big that. chart with like you know four lines of different colors would be better. Yeah, definitely. Thank you. And, and, and do you know why it dropped suddenly in the middle there for a while? <laughs> Is that just the uh, instability? Yeah, I think so. Um, <laughs> but, but that doesn't tell me anything. It's like saying it dropped in the middle because it was just bad. <laughs> but I think, um, well, I think that's one of the big problems with like modern reinforcement learning is there's a lot of moving parts. So exactly why that happened is kind of hard to tell. Um, I, it's probably due to like maybe a bad batch of data being sampled at some point in time that caused some bad gradient steps. But like this also, this also happened on a couple of the MLP experiments that I didn't show in, in the presentation. So this isn't like unique to the dendritic networks. Hmm. So just to be clear in, in when you're running these training steps, <clears throat> you're not reiterating over the same data. You're actually looking at different data to kind of approximate this, this situation. Is that correct? Yeah, so the uh, that's approximately correct. So um, how in this algorithm it works is you have a a buffer of a fixed fixed size. So in this case, 1 million. And you collect I can keep collecting data and adding it to the buffer. And once it gets like over a million, then the oldest oldest samples are kicked out and the newest ones are put in. So as as you progress through this, the, the data collected within that buffer changes. And then okay, during so there's, updates, a, there's, a, there's a window there. There's a yeah. window there that you're moving across, but you're looking at continuously changing inputs. And then when you said you got a bad batch, it meant something that's really off kilter as far as the expectations. Yeah. What that's, you've been training up to that point would be. Yeah, that's that's that, that's pretty correct. So and, like, and within that window, do you do multiple passes of, of uh, training. Yeah. So I, I, anytime you do training, you sample um, like X amount of data from that 1 million and use that for like a, a batch of gradient updates. Okay. That... So during the, as it progresses, it, it could get trained on the same batch multiple times. Yeah, it could. Same set. Like that 1 million is basically like your data set at any given time, but that data set is changing. And then right. during gradient right. updates, you're just sampling a batch from that, gradient, uh, that data yeah. set. Because the data set itself is dependent on your current learning because it, it, right? Because you are interacting with the environment. Exactly. So as you learn, the way you interact with the environment changes. So the data, the, the training data itself will change. Right? That's some of the instability here. Yeah, and that's like a that's like a pretty classic problem in reinforcement learning is like yeah, you want to explore yeah. a large part of the state space and get like a very wide training data, but also exploit what you've learned so far to be good and get more on that like narrower part. So trading off with exactly yeah. Yep. Again, all these experiments with, with one dendrite, is that right? Yeah, this is all with one segment. Okay. Did so, did you go <clears> just <throat> curious, did you go wider than 2048? No, I didn't go wider than 2048. Um, I could. Uh, these experiments took a little bit longer, <laughs> yeah. 
yeah, yeah still just, reasonable uh, it took like like to get like to get to like 20 million it took like 10 hours i think so um and with like with like 1024 or 512 it only took a few hours so the experimental time is not bad now so I a, a question if mm -hmm. within that window it's it's a first in first out policy there's not uh any um choice being made to retain some training samples for longer than others it's it's simply shifting through a set right yeah that's correct okay so if for instance there's there's no article that says this particular training example we want to hold on to for some extemporaneous reason there's no concept of that no there is no concept of that okay um there are like several methods in our reinforcement learning that don't do exactly what you mentioned but kind of prioritize certain samples over others when you're sampling from the buffer um but that we're not using any of that here so we could right i mean we could implement prioritize replay there do you think it will help um, I think it will it will probably help all of them, but it does it doesn't really show much in terms of like how dendrites perform on top of other networks. Okay, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, uh, I just want to make a remark here that this wide networks we are not controlling for number of params. So when we say wide 2048, that's actually a network four times bigger than the one on the left. So that also might be uh, why we're having better results. It's not just because it's wide. Yeah, that's why I think the it's it's useful to have all the charts together one after the other because it it would be useful to per, you know compare the wide MLP against the wide dendritic network. Yeah, just as yeah. an example. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And we are running the 2048. Like we are actually running four variations. So there is uh, with weight sparsity, with activation sparsity, just MLP, and with both, with, oh, and just dendrites. Yeah, just uh, right. No. Yeah, we can show all, all four of them in the same chart. That's going to be easier to look at. Mm -hmm. Just so I understand what you just said, when you make the network wide, you're also making it deep as well. That's implied. No, no, we are not making it deeper, but we have more brands, right? All layers are like four times bigger. Oh, oh, okay, okay, okay. So you're you're just you're just scaling it up, but you're you're not conserving the number of parameters. Okay, I got it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's is there a way to get three. this three? A couple of, yeah, sorry, sorry. Uh, Go ahead. Yeah, a couple of things. Is there a way to get like a summary number for each of these charts? I know it's very noisy and stuff. Could we say that is there a way to extract like the mean of the last few million iterations or something like that to say, okay, the network on the right was at about 81%. The network yeah. on the left was at about 43%, whatever that, you know, something like that so that we could put in a table and you can look at, um, in a, yeah. in a succinct format. There are ways to do that. So I think like typically what it, how it's done is something like you mentioned where you have like a, you look at the last X um, amount of training steps and you take the median over those or the mean over those. So some sort of statistic. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah, that And that's pretty common in, in reinforcement learning. Uh, and the other question I had, do you think the network has converged the one on the right? Looks like it might still be going higher. No, I don't think it's converged. Okay, is it still running? Uh, this one, no. I stopped it to run a couple other experiments because, yeah. But I mean, I, I think I could resume it. Okay, that's uh, it's interesting that it, it could go keep going higher. Mm -hmm. Good observation. So I think uh, so several next steps in terms of experiments, um, I think at a high level it involves just um, experimenting with different configurations of dendrites. So um, one thing is incorporating multiple segments and weight sparsity. I think uh, weight sparsity could be, it could help and also it could be a good way to uh, keep the number of trainable parameters somewhat fixed, even as we scale up other aspects of the network like adding multiple segments or even more hidden layers or widening the hidden layers. And if, like, if we just, if we increase the weight sparsity for every kind of aspect added, then the number of parameters could say, um, the, the growth in the number of parameters can be controlled. 
um, which is kind of the third bullet point as well. And I think um, a big part of this um, is also adding to the code base um, different statistics to track the properties of dendrites. So some of these were things like the mutual information statistic that uh, I've discussed in like past meetings before, um, where each like the modulation from each segment is treated as like a uh, random variable between zero and one and tracking the entropy and mutual information there. Um, some of these statistics are not incorporated into Garage yet. Um, so adding those, I think, to analyze the properties of the network would be useful. Uh, unfortunately, I have to step out now. That was, uh, I'm not sure if you're almost done, but uh, it was very nice. And I think, uh, we should, I mean, again, I would like, the only thing I'd like to emphasize here is that we should be able to get 100% of these tasks eventually, but you have to, you have to implement all these things. And um, anyway, I thought it was, I thought that was pretty cool. Anyway, Thank I have you. to say goodbye. So. Yeah. This is the last slide, so perfect timing. Good. Well, I'm going to leave right now. All right. Yeah, Kasia, it was a great job. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, so you're doing a write-up right now. Um, if we kind of step back, like, how do you feel intuitively now that you worked on it for a while? Do you, what is your overall sense of the promise of this kind of direction? I think it's uh, definitely promising because... I think it's a different test bed for the dendrites. Um, I think, so I think, yeah, like getting, like Jeff mentioned, as close to 100% as possible is possible with the dendrites. And I think um, showing that like the way dendrites add parameters to networks is a effective way of doing it will be possible with this project. Kind of similar to like, um, transformers and that like transformers have a huge number of parameters, but the way they add the parameters is like really particular and achieves really good performance. So like showing something similar where we have a lot of parameters, but the way we've added those parameters is really specific and inspired by really specific ideas and they work really well. Um, that can be done in this project. And I think like we're getting there. Um, and I think the pro like the the environment can be extended to more difficult benchmarks um, pretty readily. So like I meant, uh, I shared on the Slack recently that some people have created a continual learning version of meta world. So it uses the same base environment. It just changes the way the agent sees the tasks and changes, adapts it to a continual learning setting. So I think that could be like a good next step. So I think there's a lot of promise in that direction as well. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, that's good. Yeah, the multitask one is also, you know, just like you, your motivation earlier is also a good test bed for dendrites. It's same underlying intuitions apply, but a very different kind of uh, formalism than continual learning. Mm -hmm. uh, but the, you know, concepts of avoiding gradient interference and so on are, are still apply. Yeah. Um, do you think these are publishable results now that you've got 50 task results? Or you... I think they're close um we definitely have to like run it on multiple seeds and then do like ablation studies and things like that but i think in terms of main results um they're close and i think like this is like the lower bound because um the tuning like this is with some tuning but there's a lot more tuning to be done especially with these mm -hmm. so i think yeah it, like it's probably publishable now and definitely will be soon with like incorporating these and properly tuning. I think like one thing I noticed in this project is like, I think the tuning is a little bit tricky, especially with things with K winner activation sparsity. Um, it, like it's a little bit finicky. So like finding the right configuration can really, like once you find that right pattern, it can really get good, great performance. Yeah. yeah. And did you, did you well, have boosting turn? Did you have boosting turned on or off? Off uh, for the dendrite. Oh, yeah. Because I think yeah. like, the dendrites do that uh, or should be doing that. Kind of, yeah. They, yeah. they don't have the same pressure though. Um, but you know, the, the, with boosting, one of the big issues I think is just that the duty cycle window is, is just so short here. 
mm -hmm. um, you know, compared to the duration of a task. Yeah. So that's, um, that's an issue. Do you have a, an idea of how much of the compute power goes into that max operations? Like if you remove those max operations um, and keep the same level of sparsity that is induced by those max operation, how much efficiency or speed do you think you can keep uh, gain? Um, so I'm not really sure what the answer would be to the second part of the question is like, if you remove the max, but keep the sparsity. Um, like if you have a way to, to keep this about the same level of sparsity, but not having that max operation. Right. Um, I think we have number, like we had profiling numbers for the impact of the max that I don't remember off the top of my head, but if I pull up the Google sheets for, um, we should have that. Okay. Lucas or Supertide, do you remember approximately? I didn't, I didn't get Jeremy's question, actually. So can you, can you please repeat it? So uh, if I understand correctly, Akash said that the max operations are very computationally expensive and slow down the whole simulation and yeah, getting that uh, the info through the network. So the idea is if you find a way to keep the, cell, the same level of sparsity that is induced by using that K winner without using that K winner uh, strategy, how much of an improvement in, in uh, computation uh, or, or much uh, uh, speed and how much of your computation can speed can be improved by that. Well, but the, the max is not coming from the killing or the max is coming from the uh, dendritic uh, activations. Yeah. Um, it could, so yeah, the max taking a big though. So the fact that I'm not sure the exact number is now, but I think it was like three or four X lower. And it's not just about being a max, uh, any operation that you do to consolidate the dendrites and we try like a few uh there is an impact and yeah it was um, not like try so you mean more. if if instead of a max you have a linear operation that would be about the same computational power right oh yeah yeah, yeah. if you have a linear operation then yeah that that would but solve it then, uh, we tried summing across the dendrites right lucas and it was similar uh yeah which if if you sum it afterwards it's similar yeah any operation you do it, if you break it down into two operations uh, then you have that slowdown. Um, we've tried different versions that didn't break it down into two operations, but they're not true to what we want to do with dendrites, right? So we want that max, we want that, you know, uh, winner take all operation there. Uh, it would solve, but I don't know how we can get rid of it. Yeah, we, we've been talking a little bit with Karen about that, but we might need to do some more exploring about a solution to that. Yeah, but the short term. Yeah, we have a whole bunch of yeah. yeah, we had a whole bunch of results from the profiling we did earlier. I think all the answers are in that. If uh, it's in a Slack channel somewhere, okay. it's in a Slack um, and like a Google Sheet. I can share that with you, Jeremy. Can you, yeah, yeah, can you send me the link? That would otherwise I can go get it, but. Yeah. I, I led Jeremy to the channel as well. And yeah, Jeremy, if you can like quote on the channel, we, we discussed that. Sounds good. Thanks. On a, on a, a kind of unrelated note, like I think uh, the results that um, like Karan, Jeremy, and Tibetai, you guys got on the continual learning, um, the like improvement over like XDG. I, I am curious to like see how well like a naive like MLP network with a similar number of parameters would do in that scenario just to see like the impact of just raw like um, representational capacity. Oh, that, it would do horribly. On um, continued okay. learning, all MLPs, just standard MLPs will get chance accuracy. Okay. Or basically we'll just learn the last thing. Okay, yeah, that would make sense. It doesn't matter how big it is. Got it. So there we're a little bit better off. We don't have to worry so much about the number of parameters. It's more about just getting mm -hmm. the accuracies high enough. Yeah, here I think like, I think this is one of the big challenges here is that um, like I think any network, if you just scale up the number of parameters because it's seeing all the data can 
keep doing better. Exactly. Or yeah. uh, there's probably a point of diminishing return because it's just hard to train big networks. But um, yeah, like I think con getting good results with with the control and the number of parameters is like the challenge in this project. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I think if you took a dense network that had the same number of parameters as your wide dendritic network, it might do quite well. Yeah. Uh, and yeah, like that's kind of validated by this wide MLP. It has slightly exactly. less yeah. parameters than the dendritic. Yeah. So a question like when implement different statistics into garage, like are you contributed to the garage uh, code base or, or our copy of it? Uh, so all the changes we made to garage are basically like subclassing different, um, yeah, different classes in garage and doing the relevant changes. We haven't contributed um, anything directly to garage. So if you want to upgrade those things, we have to incorporate all that again. If like garage has a new version, we're going to have to make sure like oh, everything um, is it, Yeah, but I, for this project, we are sticking with garage and the long run, uh, I believe there are better alternatives. Uh, Facebook just released a reinforcement learning library that's fully compatible with PyTorch. So that's, I, I don't wanna contribute back to Garage, although we're, we subclass when we need it. Uh, we are like recreating some of the things we needed, but in the long run, I don't think we're gonna stick with Garage, so. But it's still Garage, you seeing our own copy. Yeah, we are kind of using our own club and, and I'm modifying a lot of things as well. So you have like a half garage, half our code base, but always like subclassing and changing the only the things we need. You're not having our own, modifying our own fork of garage. That's what you're asking. Yeah, no, I'm asking like, if, if, if do we have to, you know, they have new version, there's a new paper out there and there's a new version of garage. Do we need to keep, keep up with all those modifications? Um, I think, for the most part, no, because most of their algorithms are fixed. Like they've already implemented them correctly. Um, so like, I think, yeah, there's no, there's no real pressure to keep up. Yeah, only, only if you keep using it and like using new stuff, but yeah, like I said, I don't think that's gonna be the case. What's the Facebook library called? Uh, I don't remember the name. They released it, I think last week or two weeks ago. Uh, okay. I can send it to you later. Yeah, sure. Yeah, I wasn't aware of that one. 